Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C., and also editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, with the uh, pleasure today of talking to Joshua Mitchell, professor of uh, political science at Georgetown University, and also a sometime contributor to Providence. And I'm going to ask him to discuss uh, a little bit, or maybe more than a little bit, about the events of this week in terms of election 2020, and also about a uh, wonderful statement that he and other thinkers helped to organize earlier this fall called Liberty and Justice for All, which I was also honored to be included as a signator, which basically was a defense of uh, Western civilization and much, much more. But Joshua, thank you for joining this conversation. Thank you for having me, Mark. Good to talk with you. So I should introduce Josh as uh, an unusual hybrid of uh, Tocquevillian, Hegelian, maybe Lockean, maybe Lutheran, and also Augustinian. some Episcopalian thrown in. So is that accurate, Josh? Yeah, probably Augustinian in my core. Augustinian, uh, perhaps above all. Yes, yes. So uh, as an Augustinian, et cetera, et cetera, what is uh, your reaction to uh, the election results this week and in terms of how they um, correlate uh, historically and culturally and globally? Uh, the biggest casualty, I think, is going to be uh, further erosion of the trust in our institutions. I, uh, quite independent of whether I uh, support or, or detract from Trump, my view is uh, precisely on Augustinian grounds. You really need to have in-person voting unless there are strong reasons against it. Uh, you have, when you go to the polls, you have representatives of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party uh, looking over each other's shoulders. You've got checks and balances. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Um, as far as Trump goes, uh, you know, it's, it's too early to tell. It, it still would not surprise me if by some legal challenge this ends up in the Supreme Court and he wins. It's a long shot, but it would not surprise me entirely. Um, I guess my view is let's assume that Biden has won and let's talk about Trump in the past tense. Uh, my view is that Trump did perform a valuable service to the conservative movement. He he undid or or challenged he undid uh, two pillars of what had become uh, the Republican Party, and they were both I think in need of of replacement. The first one is the pure free market view, namely that markets have veto power over our concern for social institutions and our concern for the middle class. And the second one was uh, the, the, the neoconservative movement, the idea that somehow America has a responsibility to export democracy abroad through blood and treasure. W whether you like him or not, Trump uh, has undone both of those. And this has given clearance for a whole new group of conservatives. And, and I think even some from the old left and, and liberals to begin to think through a new basis for the Republican Party. And that has already started to happen. Uh, you are in some measure involved in that. Uh, I think it's, uh, one could safely say that the concern here is with a vibrant middle class. Uh, and that means that markets don't have veto power. Market efficiency is not the highest good. This was really the, the mantra from the Reagan administration. I remember this from the early eighties, market efficiency was the basis for establishing foreign policy. And there are still many free market conservatives who believe that. I don't think the, the post-Trump Republican Party will be constituted along those grounds. And I also think by virtue of lots of religious conservatives being involved uh, who have Burkean sensibilities about, about how you can trans how you cannot transform societies. It's very difficult to transform societies. I think you're less likely to have a kind of adventurism abroad. Uh, your listeners may not know this, but I did spend two years in post-war Iraq and uh, had some suspicions about the Iraq invasion in the first place, but having gone, it, it seemed to me that a number of us had responsibilities to go there. So I was in Kurdistan for two years as the president of the American University of Iraq in Suleimania uh, and had long talks with my Iraqi friends and, uh, and, and Kurdish friends. Um, and uh, you know, some of them were, were very pleased about the uh, getting rid of Saddam Hussein. That was very important to be sure. But I think uh, what you see emerging are a lot of habits that are very deep in Kurdish society, the habit toward centralization, for example. And so it's a, it's a deeply Tocquevillian lesson, I think, ultimately, 
about uh, about path dependency and about the importance of mediating institutions. You can't just go in at the top and think you're going to transform a society. This is, I think, a terrible error. So I do think in a post-Trump world, you're going to have a Republican Party that's thinking through these two issues, the middle class and also um, also foreign policy. But I would say one more thing. Uh, it seems to me that it's going to be a concern for the middle class that's not, if you want to use identity politics language, it's not simply going to be the white middle class. I think there's a, a growing consensus among the young conservatives I'm talking with that we really do need to have constructive understandings about how to deal with race in America. We can't just pretend that America is a colorblind society and, and that's all there is to it. We certainly aspire to that, but there is a legacy of the wound of slavery which has to be addressed. And, and I think the reason why conservatives have been reluctant to address it is that they think that as soon as you admit that there's a race problem, you have to go to massive state intervention as a way of addressing it. I think there are very many smart black conservatives, uh, Bob Woodson, Glenn Lowry, uh, William Allen, any number of others who, are, who understand that there's a race problem, but they're not interested in growing the state in order to solve it. They're interested in deeply Tocquevillian solutions. Um, namely, let us reinforce the family, let's reinforce the churches, um, let's make neighborhoods more safe, and these are things that we don't need massive state programs for. We need simply to empower those who are on the ground who are already making a difference in their community. So I think I'm actually quite pleased, quite independent of the whatever happens with this election, I'm quite pleased about a new emerging Republican Party that I think is much more sober about foreign policy, much more sober about markets, and much more sober about race. This is very, very promising. And if I may, to the, to the statement that we made, so uh, so we wrote a statement of a letter to our fellow citizens. And what we decided right from the beginning was this was not going to be a, a, a normal conservative statement. Uh, my argument for years has been that conservatives have done themselves a great big disservice by thinking about Burke alone and not in the context of Tocqueville. And my view is that Tocqueville is the one who points to the importance of mediating institutions. And yes, we can talk about religious liberty and that's important. Uh, and we can talk about free markets, but really what Tocqueville understood is that the vibrancy of American democracy were, was going to depend upon the strength of our families, the strength of all the mediating institutions that we have. And so we got together and wrote a letter and identified the six or seven mediating institutions which were at risk, uh, education, the church, the family, uh, the press. And we said, these are the things that have to be fortified. So it wasn't a high level theoretical set of claims about commitments to which conservatives um, are, are oriented. It was really an on the ground observation that, um, that this is how we're going, this is the only way we can make society healthy is fixing up our institutions. And so let us put our shoulder to that work. And it was prompted not only by the four of us who were thinking about these issues, but the, the sense that we had in talking with others, other friends of ours around the country, that things had really come undone this summer and everybody was asking the question of what can we do? And if you were only thinking in terms of national politics, you're gonna end up feeling very impotent. But if you're thinking like a Tocquevillian citizen, you're gonna say things like, well, this is what's around me. What can I do here? What do we have on the table here that we can work with? And I think that's what we have to do. National politics is important, but we really have to remember the Tocquevillian insight that we're formed in and through these mediating institutions by which we live. Well, I neglected to include among your many adjectives, you're also a Niburian yes. of sorts. And so you do bring a unique um, Augustinian hyphen uh, Protestant sensibility to how you see the world and a uh, particular spiritual perspective and how you look at America. And like Tocqueville, you see America as a ultimately a spiritual project. Yes. Is that not correct? And, and I would press this that uh, it, it, I know this makes people very nervous. But I think America will be judged uh, by history, by how we deal with, with race in America. Is that this, this can be the great contribution to history is that we, we redeem America from, from the wound of slavery. You, know, you mentioned Niebuhr. I, I've been for many years threatening to write a book on Niebuhr and I kept pushing it off. And I kept asking myself the question, why did I push it off? Well, you might remember Niebuhr's fundamental concern was uh, he wanted to remind the mainline churches of the importance of original sin. And it, in a couple of places, he says, I think I've failed in that project. And, and my argument in the last few years has been that the reason why Niebuhr, why we almost can't write about Niebuhr right now 
is because we can't think about original sin, but, but what I've suggested in the book that I've just finished, which is coming out on November 17th, American Awakening, what I've suggested is that this idea of original sin migrated, that with, with the implosion of the mainline churches after the Vietnam era, uh, I should say the softening of the mainline churches, the capitulation to culture uh, after the, it wasn't just after the Vietnam era, but I think it accelerated after the Vietnam era. Um, the churches got softer, but the idea of irredeemable stain actually migrated into politics. And my suggestion is that identity politics is the migration of an idea that actually belonged and was pre prominent in the mainline churches, namely ir the irredeemability of man. It's migrated into identity politics. And for the moment, the, there is an identifiable, irredeemable, irredeemably stained group. That's the white heterosexual male. And unless our listeners misunderstand my position, my position is that after he is purged or scapegoated, I, the logic of identity politics will require another identity group to castigate uh, because the innocence is always a relationship between the transgressor group and the groups of innocence. And once you purge the white heterosexual male, there'll be others that have to step in. And I, my argument is that first it will be the white, white woman and then it will be the black heterosexual male. Anyway, I'm saying the whole thing is a deeply twisted uh, manifestation of, of an American Christianity that can't quite return to Christianity. So you've got these categories of stain uh, and innocence, which are fundamentally biblical categories, which have migrated out of the churches. The churches are now about feeling good about yourself for the most part. I know this is a terrible generalization, but they've become quite soft. But uh, when the Pew poll indicates that um, America is increasingly becoming a generation of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, my response is, no, that's not true. They find their religion in identity politics. They find a way of understanding transgression in essence in the realm of politics now, and the churches have utterly failed us. So. The reason why I couldn't write the Niebuhr book, the, the reason why Niebuhr has become in a way difficult to understand is because the category of stain has now migrated out of the church. You, we're gonna have to get that back into the church and Niebuhr was right on this one, but it's now outside of the church in identity politics. So we are, oh. we are involved in what I call an American awakening without God and without forgiveness. In that sense, you seem to agree with, uh, largely with Jody Bottom's book, An Anxious Age in terms of uh, these religious nuns, the more elitist, are basically the, the post mainline Protestants still operating in a spiritual realm, but not sure how to how to function. Yeah, I, I read Jody's Bottoms book long before I began the identity politics book, but but I realized when I read it that he was really onto something important, uh, and, and that's right. So you've got guitar builders out in, in in Portland, and you know people who shop at Whole Foods. I mean, this is this is the Protestant class that has now found another object of spiritual veneration. I, I'm long-term, I'm actually hopeful. And let me explain why, because so much of my, <laughs> yes, I read Augustine, but the counterpoint to Augustine is always, Ryan, is always uh, Frederick Nietzsche. And, and, and what Nietzsche wanted to do was to get rid of this language of purity and stain off. Are you still with me? I think I lost yes, gotcha. a minute. Okay. You're back. Uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche wanted to get rid of this language of purity and stain altogether, to get rid of all the Christian artifacts and return to what, what he called it in some places the aristocracy of cruelty. And, and he thought that the crisis of the West would take the following form, that, that the West would think it had rejected, it, it would reject the church, but not all the trappings of the church. So it would reject all the churches, but it would not reject the idea of equality, not reject the idea of dignity of persons and dignity of work, and not reject the idea of guilt, atonement, repentance, and things like this, but it wouldn't have the Christian architecture anymore. And my argument is, is that Nietzsche was right. That is exactly where we are. We've got identity politics, which has the trappings of Christianity without, without the architecture of it. Now, that's the bad news, but that's also the good news, because if, if we really are lost, if we really t go to the next level, we will, we will be in the Nietzschean stage where, uh, according to Nietzsche, the way we have a tomorrow is by forgetting. The way a Christian has a tomorrow is by repenting of his or her sins and, and by forgiveness and atonement. That's how you have a tomorrow. If you've got the broken 
got a broken human being who's always turning toward darkness, eventually the weight, the debt becomes so heavy that you can't have a tomorrow. The gospel good news is that in fact, there's a way to have a tomorrow. It's through forgiveness, atonement, repentance. And so history is, is forever, and this is very Niberian too, forever turning toward darkness and being pulled back to the light, turning toward darkness. So you have a tomorrow only through forgiveness or repentance and atonement. The Nietzschean argument is the way you have a tomorrow is by forgetting, meaning you forget the guilt. And my worry is that the, the next stage that we're going to be facing, if we don't return identity politics to pro Christianity proper, the next stage we're going to be facing, and we're seeing it already in the alt-right, is you're going to have people saying, they're, they're reaching, to use Bob Woodson's word, racial fatigue, uh, misogyny fatigue. They're, they're just tired of being told that they're irredeemably stained and there's nothing they can do. And so they say, forget, I don't care what, what happened. I don't care about the Holocaust. I don't care about colonialism. And that's what the alt-right movements in Europe are doing right now. They're saying we're mm. tired of bearing this weight of guilt without any sort of uh, way of, of atoning for it. And so we're going to forget. And these are really the two great choices before us, in my view. We can either return to a, to a Christian way of having a tomorrow, namely uh, through a, atonement, repentance, and forgiveness, or we're going to turn to the Nietzschean way. So at least identity politics knows the right language. It's atonement, repentance, innocence, guilt. At least we still have that Christian language. The really frightening thing will be when enough people who are indicted by identity politics say, we don't care anymore, we're choosing Nietzsche. And without going into details, I have worked uh, overseas in Europe with a political party that I think is moving more in this direction. I tried to, I've tried to pull them back, they're, they're rejecting this. Uh, there's so many alt-right Nietzschean movements that are emerging now in Europe as a consequence really of this very dangerous game identity politics is playing. Namely, here's guilt, you bear it, you can't, there's no way you can get rid of it. You have to live with it forever and pay the political consequences. Human beings can't live that way. We're not put on this earth simply to bear guilt. And they're either gonna find a Christian way to resolve the problem or they're gonna turn to Nietzsche. So that's the, that's the broader picture of the historical moment I think we're in, which is why identity politics is, is deeply pernicious, a deep distortion of Christianity. Um, and yet the hopeful part of this is that it's still at least using the language and I think the answer then is to, to talk to people who are committed to this language of innocence and transgression and to suggest to them that ultimately this is, this is not the meal. They're feasting on crumbs. The meal is the Christian understanding of these things and how we have a tomorrow. Uh, so in identity politics, by the way, never, look, never looks forward. It's always looking back to find transgressions. There's no possible tomorrow for identity politics. So anyway, we're living, as I said earlier, we're living in a moment of American awakening we're living out an American awakening without God and without forgiveness. That's where we are in this intermediate Christian stage that Nietzsche wants us to finally throw off and which I want us to, to say, look, we've gone too far. We have to go back to the, to the real substance of this, which is Christianity itself. And uh, you address much of this in your last article for Providence, asking the question, shall America be a Christian society judging individuals or a tribal society? Uh, constantly implica implicating various identity groups. Yeah, this is, this is why, you know, here I come back to Niebuhr. The, the idea of original sin has many detractors, but, but when sin is original, what it means is that it's before, it's, it's always already before any genetic lineage that you might have. So it's, you know, my case, my father is Lebanese Christian. So, so it, it doesn't matter that I come from a Lebanese family or one half of my family is, that, that it's always already there. Why that's important is that if, if, if you feel guilt and it's not original, you can say, well, the reason I'm feeling bad, or the reason why there's a poison around me is that there's those people over there. And so you get tribal conflagrations, the sort of thing Rousseau talked about at the end of the social contract. You get wars where the gods are invoked and it's not really the people that are fighting, it's gods themselves. Why? Because there's a kind of ecstatic revelry ecstatic rage, it's scapegoating an enemy. And, and the Christian claim is guilt is actually so deep. The claim of original sin is that sin is so deep, you can't find a resolution to it by scapegoating the other. Well, now, if you lose that insight and you still have the guilt, what you're going to have is you're gonna have attempts to, to find purity by scapegoating other groups. And that's what identity politics is really up to. So, 
So in the final analysis, Niebuhr really was right. We do need to, to grasp some, some understanding of original sin so that we can understand that it's prior to any identification we might have as a group, and therefore prior, it, it will not work to resolve the problems that we have by scapegoating another group. My argument is that the whole of liberalism, which treats people as persons rather than members of group, is rests on this Christian understanding that there's no mortal scapegoat that can solve our problem. It's precisely when sin is original that we realize we can't see ourselves as members of a group, but we have to see ourselves as individually fallen uh, and, and redeemed by the divine scapegoat. You take away that and we return to more archaic understandings of the scapegoat, which is exactly what identity politics is doing. It's saying we can solve this problem of impurity by scapegoating groups. This is, this is basically a return to paganism. The one caveat I would make is that it's a mix of paganism and Christianity because what Christianity gives us is the interiority of the person. And so this deep uh, sense of guilt and a deep sense of feeling and sentiment. So it's what you have with identity politics is this mixing of on the one hand group, group scapegoating, but profound internal uh, suffering that you, that you can only get with Christianity. That's why you've got both group scapegoating and safe spaces for individuals who are so, so psychologically wounded, you feel this deep interior weight, this burden that they need all sorts of protection. So it's this very bizarre amalgam containing archaic pagan roots and this Christian insight about interiority. It's a very twisted moment we're living in. And I think Nietzsche got it right. We're gonna, Europe in, in the West is gonna be caught in this halfway uh, condition where it can't quite fully go back to Christianity and can't quite reject it either. And I think that's what identity politics is. And then finally, Josh, related to your point about uh, offering hope, it seems like our uh, ostensibly post-Christian age, post-Protestant age is uh, increasingly uh, apocalyptic in its uh, conversation, its attitudes, its warnings. Uh, obviously an Augustinian sensibility would argue against this constant threat of uh, apocalypse. Uh, how do we do that? Well, this is wonderful. So uh, I just finished teaching some small first portion of the City of God. And, and I focus on the preface to the City of God. And in fact, just a couple of lines of it. We wait in steadfast patience until justice returns in judgment. The, the idea of hope, hope recognizes that, that the justice of the world is never quite complete. And that at the end, there'll be a full accounting. Identity politics can be understood as an impatience with that accounting system, an attempt to, to bring about a final reckoning right now. So the, the full weight of slavery must now be paid for. The full weight of colonialism must now be paid for. In Europe, the full weight of nationalism must now be paid for. How? By renouncing the nation and making the European Union project. Uh, the, the, the way in which Europeans can buy atonement from the sin of nationalism. So this, you're, you're very right, this Augustinian idea that somehow God's in charge of the timeline and that what we will observe in the world of time is a partial justice, this, this cannot be endured uh, by identity politics. Another really good way of looking at this is through the lens of the parable of the wheat and the tares. So in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the servant plants the wheat, comes back to the master, says, master, we've got weeds growing with the wheat, shall I pull them up? And the master says, no, don't pull them up, lest by pulling them up, we'll pull out the good wheat with the bad weeds, leave them until the harvest, and they'll be separated at the harvest. Well, we know what this means. It means that all of time has this, has this mixed aspect to it. We can't fully get rid of evil. When we do, we'll probably rip out the good things. In Tocquevillian language, to get rid of the coarseness of local life, by having national projects, we're gonna get rid of all the important mediating institutions by which we live. So the, the, the identity politics insight is really, it's captured with the problem of the, that's identified in the parable of the wheat and the tares, mm -hmm. namely an impatience with the intermixed nature of good and evil in the world of time. Thomas Jefferson was a mixed figure. All of the founding fathers were mixed figures. The Christian understands that we live in a mixed world and have to wait in patience and in hope uh, but, but with identity politics, there's an acknowledgement of the stain, but an in, inability to live with anything that's impure. This carries over even to the climate change movement. And I'm, I'm all for advancing technologies and get, getting rid of filth, so don't get me wrong. 
But what I'm troubled by is the, as it were, spiritual overtones of this. We have clean energy and dirty fossil fuels. These aren't scientific categories. These are religious categories. And I get very nervous when in the name of science, we're actually doing something that's it's answering a religious impulse. We have to be able to live in an intermixed, somewhat dirty world. And it's, it's through faith and hope that Christians are able to do that, knowing that there'll be a balancing at the end of history. But when you get rid of the idea of a balancing that God does at the end of history, you get the impulse to try and do it right now. And that's what we have with identity politics and impatience with the impure world of time. Joshua Mitchell of Georgetown University, thank you for a, as expected, fascinating conversation and look forward to your impending new book. Thank you.